I saw your name, I'm like, oh, well, that's exactly like my, yeah, she lives in Syracuse. She's in her so 50s. you should tell her there's a Lori Smith that spells it like that. She's the town manager at Kinnebuck. And so people always, I live in Dover. Oh, Carol is Carol. Oh, you're from Kinnebuck. She is? Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, take it off. Yeah, it has a lot of problems. Yes. We had a children set and we had a people back. But, uh, I didn't make this good. It's good. I hate her. How are you? But, uh, yeah, I just escaped. Are we posing or candid? This is candid. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. What it's are you doing? It's just water, so. <laughs> now, we're going to start the It's video. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Terry, such a great success. First of all, I hope you enjoyed the music this evening. Um, that was provided by our state representative, Michael Cahill, along with Richard Garzina and Greg Brown. And thanks to all the family photos and political photos provided to us by Alan Norelli. Um, a long look back <laughs> history <laughs> with Terry, and that'll be running throughout the evening. Um, I also would like to thank members of our committee that um, are our in-house volunteers this evening: Sue Hubbard, Debbie, State Representative Debbie DeFranco, Mary Ann Blanchard, Nancy Brown, Sharon Nichols, Brian Wazla, and Ann Gable. And they events at Portsmouth Harbor Events and Content Center, and they have been a beautiful venue, and I just want to like say thank you to all the banquet staff. Um, they do an incredible job, and will do another, I'm sure, a very nice job this evening, and it's a pleasure working with David Steady, our events manager here, who could not have been more accommodating, so I want to acknowledge that. on the cover of our souvenir program book. Please take those home. Um, there's so a lot of good stuff inside of that. And we thank Michelle Robbins of B&B Printing for, for providing those uh, for the I'd also like to uh, say a great big thank you to everyone who signed and watched an ad that's on the thank you page inside the program book we'll for Terry and everyone who purchased half and full page ads for our program. That helps us fund a lot of the activities that our local committee will do, and we are most appreciative. Most importantly, too, our very special supporters this evening, our sponsors, Senator Martha Fuller Clark, our part that a big hand at the end of this, um, our partners, Joe Playa and Harold and Elizabeth Janeway, and friends of our committee as well, of Alice Chamberlain, Barb, S Barb Sador, Catherine Walsh, and the professional firefighters of New Hampshire. Thank you to all of you. activism and, pu um, and public service and wow <laughs> harness the energy and, and good what we could do from this room so what I want to say to everybody who you are welcome to pull your phones out feel free to take photos and tweet and murky and post on Facebook we have over 175 people here tonight want them to get out and let's celebrate enjoy your dinner and have a fun evening thank you Democratic National Committee, and Ray is always very gracious about emceeing uh, these events. He does it for the Portsmouth Dems, the Rockingham Dems, so whenever I ask him, he's always very, very supportive. So let's give a, a warm Portsmouth welcome to Ray Butler.
Dems, but the uh, Rockingham County uh, Dems uh, as well. Um, I thought we should start off, I think there's one subject that all of us have been talking about this past uh, week or so, and that is uh, what occurred to the fourth graders uh, who went to the Hampshire House of Representatives. What I found interesting is because it, it, it was when I went to uh, the New Hampshire House when I was in fourth grade, and that's when I decided I wanted to serve in the New Hampshire legislature. And it really inspired me to want to be part of the House and be part of that. And I can only imagine what those couple dozen fourth graders now think. I don't think that they were inspired uh, to want to be not only in the New Hampshire House, but to be in politics uh, as well. And so. Uh, I've uh, had a conversation with one member uh, uh, that uh, chose to speak against them that day. It didn't go so well. Uh, but I would encourage you to uh, to reach out to all three of those House members because whether they were um, inappropriate uh, or not, uh, their whole tone, if you watch the video, was, uh, was offensive to the House. And I suspect that if uh, Terry Norelli was the Speaker of the House, that that would have been nipping the butt. I was, you know, I served 18 years in the legislature. When I said my little goodbye speech, one of the things that I said is, I hope that one day, that we're going to have a speaker that returns uh, decency uh, back to the House chamber. Uh, what I experienced when I first started working there, first started serving. Little did I know it was only be two years later uh, that Terry Norelli would become the Speaker of the House, and uh, everyone agrees uh, that she was uh, the best speaker of, of uh, our time. I female uh, uh, Democratic speaker, but really as a speaker. And what she did, she was the speaker of the House. She wasn't just a Democratic speaker. She treated every member with the utmost of respect. And that is exactly uh, what we should, we should try to have for all of our leaders uh, in the legislature, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Uh, she served three all of her uh, great uh, debt of gratitude for her. Larry said, I, I can't introduce um, most of the people in the room like I usually uh, do because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen speakers. <laughs> but I also so know that Michael King gets furious with me if I don't acknowledge his presence. He's been for a while. Michael, the former chair of the New Hampshire Democratic Party. Remind me that she was here, so I assume that she wants to So Dorothy's off for a second by chair. Thank you for all of you. And then it just kind of explodes from there because you've got Mary Rao, a former vice chair, and Maureen Manning, a former vice chair, so we should acknowledge them as well. And uh, in the car with Chris, so I better acknowledge Executive Counselor Chris Pappas for Manchester. Ooh, hey. Somebody that uh, we are going to hear this story, but uh, truly the reason that uh, Terry came to the legislature was because Martha recruited her back in 1996. So please welcome our first vice chair, uh, State Senator Martha Bullock. Thank you. 
here. Well, maybe I'll just hold it. Okay. <laughs> um, I, say, oh, I, I wanted to just start by saying it's wonderful, truly wonderful, to see so many of you here tonight to honor Terry. And it is my privilege to be the first of the many speakers to recognize her remarkable service to the state of New Hampshire and to legislators across the country and beyond. When I first asked Terry to run for the New Hampshire House from Ward 2 here in Portsmouth, I knew she would be a great legislator, but I had no idea how to do it. small commitment <laughs> that would only take a few hours a day, two or three days a week in Concord. How many of us have heard that before? And I am sure Alan and Gina and Daniel have never forgiven me. What I was able to do was to convince her that all the great work that she had done for the sexual assault services here on the Seacoast and her passion for women's issues heightened since her then recent return from the Women's Conference in Beijing, that those interests could be best addressed by serving in the New Hampshire legislature, which has certainly turned out to be true. If you have followed Terry's trajectory in the New Hampshire House, you know that her voice and her vote have been forceful and effective on every single woman's issue that has come before the legislature. It ranges from protecting a woman's right to make her own health care decisions over and over again to making sure that our insurance companies here in New Hampshire would cover contraception for women. Amazing. To protecting qualified deliveries, to passing equal pay for equal work. Bravo. But of course, as we now know, this is only a small part of Terry's illustrious career as a member of the New Hampshire House. In the 1990s, serving on the House Science and Technology Committee, she was the leading Democratic voice on energy and telecommunication policies. Her quick grasp of complicated issues, which she then translated into easily understood language for the rest of us, and her persuasive voice in caucus and in the floor soon made it evident that she was a force not to be dismissed, nor trifled with. Watching Terry emerge as an effective leader has been truly wonderful. And for me, it was especially thrilling to see her elected as the first Democratic female speaker of the House in 2006. Such an exciting year for Democrats as we took back the Democratic majority in the House for the first time since the Civil War. Truly a change that many of us here tonight thought we would never see in our lifetime. Other speakers following me will talk more about Terry's time as speaker, both from 2006 to 2010, and again from 2012 to 2014. But I know from observing her from afar in my role as a senator, that she was a remarkable speaker. Fair, smart, definitely unflappable, polite, kind, respectful, gracious, privileged and stalwart in her support of democratic values and equality for all. And that is what her embodiment of all these qualities which made her such an outstanding president of the National Council of State Legislators. 
Her role as their leader brought honor to our, all of us here in New Hampshire as we basked in her success and were awed at her energy and stamina as she served simultaneously as Speaker of the House and NCSL's President. I don't know if she had to be a little crazy. I <laughs> do that, but you were wonderful. In closing, I would like to take a few minutes to comment on a few other key qualities that Terry has which deserve to be recognized and celebrated. She has proven to be a very good listener and thus a good negotiator. She has a great sense of humor, in case you didn't know that, an essential quality in a successful leader, a great smile, and a most memorable laugh. <laughs> she knows how to have fun in addition to working hard. She's very good at parties, about which I am sure there are some great stories out there for others to tell. And did you know that she rides a motorcycle, drives a sports car, swims, snowshoes, kayaks, paints, and does photography. That she is a voracious reader, whether it be real books or books on tape, because Terry is never one to waste time, especially when traveling back and forth to Concord or elsewhere. She belongs here on the seacoast to both the book group and the investment club, and I'm sure there's some other membership she has that I don't know about. She is an intrepid traveler, both for business and pleasure. I'm not sure there's a country she hasn't visited. She especially likes remote and exotic places where she goes with colleagues and friends and family, but never with an organized tour. <laughs> she is also a great wife, a mother, a loyal friend, and obviously, a most remarkable woman. Terry, it is truly an honor and a privilege to have you as a friend and a colleague. We all love and admire you. When uh, Terry decided to run for the House in 96, the very first thing that I learned of was uh, her commitment and her act, uh, activities within the women's community and more specifically in the pro-choice community. And so it's fitting that we have Susan Arnold, one of the top leaders in the pro-choice community here in the state of New Hampshire, uh, speak uh, tonight. So please welcome. so happy to, to say it and to tell it and uh, I guess what can I say maybe take a little credit although I think Terry pretty much did it all herself uh, many years ago and it's, it's nice that you know Alan's uh, slides over there sort of set the tone because you always have to go backwards in time so you have to you know I didn't have gray hair I didn't have glasses I didn't have a child <laughs> Um, I was a, a young organizer for Nehru in New Hampshire, and um, this was about 1990. And let's see, um, Jean Shaheen was the chair of the House PAC, Peg Gobi was the executive director, and the two of them, um, in their visionary way, decided that it was time to create a uh, what we would now call a, a voter file. Uh, we called it a choice voter list, and we bought voter file index cards, 60,000 of them, Republican and independent women, and we used volunteers to call every last one. The goal being to create a list of pro-choice, independent, and Republican women that we could mobilize in the 1992 election on behalf of choice in this state where choice was not a partisan issue. Um, as a Seacoast organizer, I got on the phone and started dialing that, you know, who, who's out there who might help us make these calls? And there was this woman named Terry Norelli, and I called her, and she was a math teacher at Winnicott, so she didn't have a lot of time, but sure, she could make some phone calls. So first she, you know, came to a phone bank, and she 
just, she was very good. And then we decided that we couldn't just do all this in phone bank. People actually needed to take these index cards home and make calls from home. And I asked Terry if, if she would like to be the local organizer of that, sort of the point person for the people in, in Portsmouth who to do that. And she said, well, you know, I'm still pretty behind, but I guess I could do that. And it was like, okay, you know, there she goes. And um, that's, <clears throat> that's how I got to know Terry, as one of the uh, keystone organizers for NARAL in, in a massive phoning effort that took about a year and a half, but did successfully end up with a choice voter list of about 20,000, again, done from index card. This is before computers, no predictive dialing, nothing. These were women and men all over the state dialing numbers, and Terry was a key, key part of that. Um, so when Terry has now gone on to um, all of the wonderful things that others have already said and we'll be saying more about, um, you know, her commitment to a women's right to choose um, her, it just, it has never wavered and regardless of whether she was not in the house, a state rep or the speaker of the house, um, she's been a friend. She's been an unwavering supporter. It was, there was never a time when we could not go to Terry and say, um, we need your help, and she would offer it. So uh, again, I mean, it's hard to, to talk with what, what Martha so, said so well. But, um, I have such fondness and respect and just feel very honored um, that we've had a woman like Terry Norelli to help represent all of us here in New Hampshire. So thank you very much. Speaker has been in the House, and I'm not saying he's been in the New Hampshire House forever, but if you add up Mary Jane Walner and, and his time and Laura Pantalakis, it goes back to the 1700s. <laughs> <laughs> David Cody from Is about um, I, when I was sitting on the in the front row of section two in the house the day Terry Norelli got up to speak. There's a little grapevine that usually functions around the time of orientation in the house, where the people who've been around for a while go trolling for people on committees and talk about people who are really good or really bad who come from various places around the state. I started to hear about this woman named Terry Norelli, and I had not met her. And um, one day, the Science and Technology Committee in the House had a very technical bill that they were debating, and Representative Norelli got up, and next to me in those days sat Marion Copenhaver from Etna, New York. And Marion Copenhaver used to have a habit of turning to me if somebody was doing a really bad job or a really good job and expressing her opinion about the qualities of the speaker. And I have to say, I occasionally did that myself. <laughs> and on this particular day, this person who was a freshman Democrat got up, explained a highly technical bill in highly understandable language and basically knocked our socks off. And I looked at Mary Copenhaver and I said, this one's going to be really good. Aww. And she said, you're right. But how do you know she's going to, you know, sometimes they look really good and they turn out to be really hard to work with. <laughs> I, don't any names, but, uh, I don't have to go into what happened next because Martha basically talked about all of that. But I will tell, I will tell another story. After 24 years in the house, when we took the majority, Speaker Norelli asked me to be the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, and which was a great honor for which I thank her. Um, and I had many interesting experiences during that time. One of those experiences was there was a situation regarding a um, bill. And some of you who have not been in the House may not understand what it means when a speaker comes down off the roster to speak in favor of a bill. Terry's breathing a sigh of relief because she thought I was going to tell a different story. Than that. 
Um, but I told you I wouldn't tell it. So, um, so basically what happens is no speaker gets down off the rostrum. Some speakers never do. Some speakers, you know, once. There was a bill that would have permitted transgender people to file complaints before the New Hampshire Human Rights Commission. That's all it did. It didn't do anything else. I promise you, I know how to read bills. That's not what the other side said about it. I'm not going to say anything about what they said about it. But we knew we were going to lose it. And the next thing I saw was Terry Norelli coming up, down off the rostrum to speak for that bill. And Donald said I couldn't choke up, and Raymond said I had to take only three minutes. So all I'm going to say about that is that that's one reason why I'm here tonight, and I would go anywhere to say nice things about Terry Norella. Yes. Next up was uh, Terry's second chief of staff. Uh, he arrived after working for me, so he's well trained. <laughs> <laughs> We said, um, you know, as, as, uh, Speaker Norelli's uh, second chief of staff, um, and I have the pleasure of talking about probably the most exciting um, portion of the speaker's accomplishments: uh, personnel policies and state house administration. So, <laughs> <laughs> for my allotted three minutes, um, you know, I think we'll hear a lot tonight, and I think Representative Cody just talked a little bit about uh, some of the great and historic uh, legislation that the speaker worked on in her time in the House. Um, but um, Boston clergyman and uh, he was an abolitionist, Philip Brooks once said, character may be manifested in great moments, but it's made in the small ones. Um, certainly we're all here because of uh, Speaker Norelli's uh, courageous leadership and, and uh, the uh, uh, strong advocacy she showed while she was in the spotlight. But I want to give you a sense of some of those small moments um, that I witnessed uh, that she, um, that truly revealed her character. So. Um, Prior to um, Speaker Norelli taking over in 2006, now this is beyond, uh, this is before my time though, so if I'm exaggerating, please feel free to correct me next. Uh, but uh, before Speaker Norelli took over, Republican and Democratic staffers um, were paid differently, even though they had the same titles uh, and did the same amount of work. Um, I think some would argue that they did a lot more work than the Republican staffers in those days, but um, they always argued, you know, since they had the majority, they had more members, they should get paid more. So um, this was also a common theme across every uh, legislative office in the building, but it was nowhere more evident than when you're talking about the same position, just different parties. Um, so one of the first things that she did when she took over was uh, to make sure that they were all paid equally, uh, including the Republicans, um, and she put them all on the same pay scale. Um, you know, eight years later, that pay system is still in place, and everybody is treated equally, whether they're Democrat, Republican, or nonpartisan. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, it's a great example of how, um, you know, we talk about equal pay for equal work, but it's something that certainly behind the scenes that nobody really sees that proves uh, that that's, you know, that core belief is put into action. So, so that was um, one, one thing. You know, I do want to just tell one other quick story, and again, um, it may be a little exaggerated, but I think it drives home, you know, the difference between um, the times when uh, Speaker Norelli was uh, in office and when the Republicans were in charge. So, um, right when they took over again back in 2006, um, there is a transition period. Um, we went through it um, a lot in the last few years, but. Uh, when Speaker Norelli and the Democratic leadership uh, picked, packed up their offices, or their office, and moved down the hall to the majority office suite for the first time in, in almost 100 years, um, they noticed that everything was covered, all the computers and furniture was all covered in plastic. And it wasn't because the Republicans were packing up to leave, or that they were doing some renovating before folks, uh, before they left, but it was because when it rained, the roof leaked. You know, the, the house, the state house was literally falling apart, and instead of fixing it, 
they, uh, they decided that putting plastic sheeting over everything would fix the problem. So if there's a better metaphor about how the how Republicans think, even to this day, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> problems facing our state, um, you know, Speaker Norelli, you, you demonstrated what is best in a leader. You took care of the little things so that the rest of us could take care of the big things. Um, and it was a privilege working for you and uh, an experience I'll never forget. And on behalf of the State House staff, uh, thank you for everything you did for the state. And now we'll hear from the man who made Ryan's life easy because he uh, already uh, broke in, uh, Terry. Uh, our, our first uh, chief of staff of the House, Donald Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always a pleasure to call you, Mr. Chairman. He does an amazing job. We're really sincerely grateful for everything that you do. We're so instrumental in, in uh, you know, uh, bringing that majority uh, 26, 28, 2012, 2016. Uh, it's great to be in Portsmouth, a city that will soon be featured um, as a space on an <laughs> Thank you. I'm sincerely honored to be with you this evening to honor such a dedicated public servant. Uh, one of the kindest gestures we can offer one another is a simple thank you. Um, so, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to join with the people in this room, your Portsmouth family, um, and others from around the state in expressing my gratitude for your years of service to the people of our state. Um, Larry Drake does an amazing job. And thank you enough. Many, many years have passed, had passed, until the stars finally aligned for Democrats in the House in 2006. 84 years, to be exact. And I believe that's a long time by any accounting. 84 consecutive years of Republican rule in this state. Thank God it wasn't these Republicans. Um, um, but how did we survive that? Well, we long-suffering Democrats used to joke that we had more fun losing than the Republicans ever had winning. <laughs> um, but when I began working for the, the Democratic House minority more years ago uh, than I care to, re care to remember, um, uh, our numbers were hovering right around 100. Now, there are a number of states that don't even have that many members in their entire house. Uh, but, um, of course, here in New Hampshire, that's a significant mi minority. So we toiled away in hopes that someday we would achieve the majority. We all know that the 2006 election changed everything, and we know that Terry Norelli changed everything. You know, the first speaker with a Democratic majority in 84 years, only the second woman ever to be speaker in this state. So what were those early days like? It was work, it was very hard work. Long days, and sometimes long nights, Choosing a leadership team, appointing chairs and vice chairs, a committee, sorting out staff, deciding who would park where, who would be seated where, the important things, parking and seating. Um, uh, dealing with the press, dealing with Republicans who were less than thrilled to be moving out of the Speaker's office and out of the majority office and down the hall for the first time in any of those ways. Working with the Democratic Senate and a Democratic governor, and most of all, dealing with expectations. Uh, the speakership is equal parts politics and administration. Would she be up to the job? Would she be able to run the place? Could she keep the trains running on time? Did she have a sense of history and her place in it? Well, the answer to these questions, as we all know, is a resounding yes. And many times over, Madam Speaker, thanks to your leadership. Um, a quick story, 2010, as we all know what happened in the 2010 election, uh, the uh, transition was happening. And a new legislator who was of this, whatever stripe they call themselves, free state, hardcore libertarian, whatever, came in. And I thought to myself, well, this guy just got elected to the House. 
<coughs> so he walked into the speaker's office and he looked around at the paintings and he looked at the list on the table and he looked at the leather sofa that was there that had been there since time immemorial and he said, does this all belong to the people of New Hampshire? He said, well, of course it does. He said, so we could sell it if we wanted. <laughs> and he was dead serious. So I thought to myself, well, if you don't believe that we need a government, then why do you need a building for the government? And why do you need furnishings you know, for the offices uh, in the state house? That's really indicative of, uh, of what uh, the Republican Party has become. Uh, so, uh, Madam Speaker, she has served 18 years in the House representing the people of Portsmouth, chosen by her peers to be their speaker three times. No speaker has ever served more than three terms in the history of the Hampshire House. It's a great compliment to you, Madam Speaker. Um, out to see if we can get uh, Governor Dean uh, to come and speak. And um, he is uh, in Vietnam uh, tonight. And so then uh, a couple of days ago, he reached out and said, can you get a letter from him? And so uh, we received the I text Governor Dean, and he emailed back this letter from Vietnam. And it's in English. So I <laughs> Uh, dear friends, I'm sorry I cannot be here with you tonight to honor my friend Terry Norelli. I was proud to earn uh, her support when I ran for president in 2004 and was impressed by her work ethic and respect shown to her by her colleagues in the House, fellow community members, and other New Hampshire Democrats. When Democrats won control of the New Hampshire House in 2006, it was no surprise to see Terry Norelli elected by her peers as the first Democratic speaker uh, in decades. A lot of decades. Uh, because of her steady leadership, New Hampshire made great progress by passing marriage equality, expanding access to health care, and advancing the progress made by women in the Granite State. Speaker Taryn Relly is one of New Hampshire's brightest stars, and I'm honored to call her a friend. I know she will continue to be a strong leader in New Hampshire, and I look forward to her continued accomplishments. My very best. How are you? letter to you from um, Washington, D.C. from Senator Sheehan. Dear friends, I wish I were able to join you tonight in Portsmouth together to honor Tori, Terry Norelli, one of the hardest working servants Concord has ever known, and someone I am lucky to be able to call my friend. Anyone who is, knows Terry is aware of her tireless commitment to serving others, from her time as a mathematics teacher at Winnicott High School, to her nine terms as a state representative, to her history-making tenure as Speaker of the House. Terry has made an enduring impact on countless lives. Her strong advocacy was a constant on issues such as marriage equality, victims' rights, as well as her efforts to expand health care access to all. New Hampshire will miss her leadership in the House. As Governor and as U.S. Senator, I have always cherished Terry's friendship, and I have come to value her counsel and her support. I know she will continue to accomplish great things and in this exciting new chapter of her life. My best to all of you and your future endeavors. Sincerely, Jean Shaheen, United States Senator.
and, uh, and introduce uh, uh, Kathy Sanchez reading a letter from our next U.S. Senator, but then I figured there'd be a reporter here, and then I get an angry call uh, from the governor. So, uh, Kathy Sanchez to read a letter from Governor Maggie Hassan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From the Office of Senator Maggie Hassan, Assistant Attorney General for the State of New Hampshire. Dear friends, I regret that I cannot be with you this evening, but I want to join you in celebrating the long and distinguished career of our good friend, Speaker Terry Norelli. Throughout her career, Speaker Norelli has been an able advocate for her district and the people of New Hampshire. Time and time again, she has put the people of her district and her state first and helped work across party lines to pass legislation that addresses some of the Granite State's most pressing issues. This includes a bipartisan health care expansion plan that we passed last year, which is the most significant piece of health care legislation the state of New Hampshire has seen. access the peace of mind and health and financial security that comes with quality, affordable health coverage. During her three terms as speaker, she worked to make the House more open and transparent, while also ensuring a fair process and a voice for all. Throughout her distinguished nine-term career in the House, Speaker Norelli's unyielding commitment to the people of New Hampshire has been critical in improving the well-being of Granite State families, and I thank her for her years of dedicated service and her friendship. Moving forward, I know that Speaker Norelli will be a great leader for the New Hampshire Women's Foundation, where she will continue to make a positive difference for all Granite Staters. unyielding commitment to public service. Because of her efforts, our families, our communities, and our state are stronger. With every good wish, signed Maggie Hassan. And to read a letter from our second district congresswoman, Andy McLean Custer, Holly Pikes. I'm sorry I'm not able to join you tonight, but please know my thoughts are with you and all sorts of Democrats as you recognize and honor one of New Hampshire's truly great public servants. <coughs> For nearly 20 years, Speaker Norelli has been the voice, the heart, and the conscience of New Hampshire Democratic Party. Throughout her time at the State House, Speaker Norelli's unwavering commitment to advancing the economic and civil rights of all Granite Staters earned her the respect of colleagues on both sides of the aisle. She not only led Granite State to adopt marriage equality, among many other legislative accomplishments, but she brought to the State House chambers an unparalleled level of transparency, civility, and mutual respect. For this, our entire state owes her a great debt of gratitude. On behalf of my constituents all across New Hampshire's second congressional district, I thank the Portsmouth Democrats Committee for honoring such a deserving public servant, and I thank Terry for all she has contributed to the Granite State and its people. Sincerely, Ann McLean Custer. For most people, I've just been announcing uh, the district. But um, the next speaker is actually somebody who deserves, uh, in her own right, um, uh, an evening like this because uh, her 35 years in the New Hampshire House has been an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, and truly, New Hampshire is a different place because of the work and the effort. Our children's lives, our elders' lives, all of our lives are better because of the work of Mary J. Wall. Please welcome Mary J.
everybody knows this is very, very uncomfortable for me to be um, up in front of so many people. So even though I've been in the legislature for a long time, I still, I still uh, suffer from stage fright, I think. Um, in the summer of 2006, Carrie decided she would run for the House Democratic leader. So she brought together some of her most loyal supporters, and we met every week from July to November. Our meetings took place at the daycare center where I work. We always met at nap time. <laughs> and Terry kept us focused on the spreadsheets and letters and contacts and phone calls to all of the Democratic state rep candidates. No one got just one call. Oh no, Terry made sure everyone got multiple contacts and she charted every call on a spreadsheet. Terry's organizational skills are unmatched. She always arrived at the meetings with updated spreadsheets and reports on the volume, volumes of phone calls that she had made. Sometime in the fall, as we got closer to election day, someone at the meeting said, what if the Democrats win the majority? Won't we need to change track and ask people to vote for Norelli for speaker? One of our letters was planned to go out the day after the election, asking Democrats to vote for Terry for the leader. But in the off chance that Democrats took the majority, a Norelli for Speaker letter was also prepared. Not one person at those meetings had ever served in the majority, because the House had been in the hands of the Republicans since the Civil War. So the idea of taking the majority was a novel idea. Well, you know what happened on election day in 2006. The first Democratic majority in over 100 years was elected in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. We sent out the Morelli for Speaker letter, and Terry was elected the first Democratic Speaker in the New Hampshire House for 84 years. Terry went on to serve as our speaker for six years and led by example, always fair, always open to new ideas, and always thoughtful and caring of all the members and the staff. Terry has great respect for the New Hampshire House and the representatives and she and her leadership style will be missed. You all know that Terry served with distinction as speaker of the New Hampshire House. But what you may not know about is Terry's service on the national level with the National Conference of State Legislators. In the summer of 2007, as Terry was completing her first six months as speaker, she attended the National Conference of State Legislators meeting in Boston. Terry was immediately like the organization. It stood for the things she believed in. It was a bipartisan organization providing 7,000 state legislators with support, information, best practice, ideas, and a strong voice at, for the state at the Capitol, and Capitol Hill. And it was obvious from the first meeting that NCSL recognized in Terry the leadership styles they thought important in the legislature. And they also saw a future NCSL leader. In 2011, the 7,000 strong membership of NCSL elected Terry as their president. And in 2000, 2012, she served as the NCSL president. In the state legislators' world, being the president of NCSL is a really big deal. And for Terry, who is from a very small state, to be chosen as president spoke volumes to her incredible leadership, skills, and her magnetic personality. It was a great honor, not just for Terry, but for New Hampshire to have had a New Hampshire legislator elected as president of NCSL. During her term as president, Terry traveled all over the United States and internationally representing all state legislators. Bill Pound, who is the uh, current executive director of the uh, Council of State Legislators, I'm sorry, for the um, National Conference of State Legislators, <laughs> wrote to me and said, and I quote, I want to thank and congratulate Terry for not only what she did as a leader 
the New Hampshire House, but for legislators nationwide as a leader and president of the National Conference of State Legislatures. She was always available and on spot with good advice. Terry is widely respected and admired for her leadership role for the nation's state legislatures. It has been a pleasure to work with her and even better to count Terry and her family as a friend. She, Bill wants to also thank the Portsmouth City Democrats for honoring her tonight. In conclusion, I'd just like to say what a privilege it's been for me to have served with Terry. And I know I can speak for all legislators who served with Terry in saying that we wish her the best and thank her for her service and her dedication to New Hampshire. Um, because you can never really <laughs> represent yourselves in a manner that will in, in any way compare. And so our next speaker was brilliant. He <coughs> let the Republicans have the majority this time. So <laughs> he's not going to compare with Terry when he's speaker uh, next term. And all we have to uh, compare to is the, the circus that's going on with the Republicans now. So the next speaker of the New Hampshire House, Steve Scherzer. <laughs> Month, I had the pleasure of attending the Plymouth Area Democrats annual fundraising dinner. And the theme of that night was honoring former Democratic legislators from the greater Plymouth area. And one of those being honored was our good friend, uh, the former representative from Campton, Jim Aguia. And Jim that night told a story that I'd never heard before, and I think it bears repeating tonight. As you've heard, for uh, 84 years before Terry became Speaker, the Republicans controlled the third floor of the State House. And one of the rooms they had up on the third floor was a Republican lounge. It was a lounge that had coffee and a computer and the newspapers were out for them, but it was for Republican House members only. After Cherry became Speaker, she moved that lounge to a much bigger room on the first floor of the State House, and she opened it up to Democratic and Republican House members and Democratic and Republican members of the Senate. And one day, as Jim told the story, we had a Democratic luncheon, and there's a lot of sandwiches left over and cookies and brownies. And the speaker said to Jim, would you bring this big tray of food down to the lounge on the first floor so everybody can share it? And Jim did. And as he walked into the room with this tray of food, there was a Republican member of the House there, and she said to Jim, what's all that food for? And Jim said, well, we Democrats had a luncheon today, and this is the food that's left over, and the Speaker wanted everybody to be able to share in it. And the woman looked at the food, and with some disdain, she said to Jim, I know one difference between Democrats and Republicans. And Jim asked her what that difference was. And she said, it's quite obvious we Republicans eat a lot better than you Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim, without skipping a beat, said, I know another difference between us Democrats and you Republicans. And she said, well, what's that? She said, we Democrats are willing to share with whatever we have with anyone. <laughs> and for all you've done. As I've said before, someone had to secede Terry as a Democratic leader in the House, but nobody can ever replace her. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On uh, Sunday, May 3rd, I calling you to pick up and get the ad in. Uh, we are going to be honoring another speaker, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Current Democratic leader is going to be joining us for our McIntosh Inc. Hunter Club dinner. Uh, and we certainly welcome you. Uh, Terry has agreed to be one of our, our co chairs, along with Sylvia Larson, uh, Dan uh, Feltis, and Tom Sherman as well. Uh, but that evening isn't just going to be uh, celebrating for the first time. 
uh, having us, the speaker come to a state of the event. We're going to be honoring uh, the eight women uh, that we have nominated for Congress in New Hampshire. And I thought I, I knew it, but of course I picked up the phone called Bill Gardner. It's three hours later when I hung up the phone. <laughs> know that in 1832, <laughs> it was the New Hampshire Democrats that caused for the first National Democratic Convention to occur, and I know the whole, I can tell you everything that happened. Uh, but uh, what we're doing is comparing uh, notes. Uh, there were eight women uh, and that we have nominated for Congress in the history uh, of the uh, state of New Hampshire, uh, the state Democratic Party. Uh, three of them are with us uh, here tonight. Uh, we know, we've already acknowledged Senator Marcus Clark, who was our nominee in, in, uh, in 2000 and in 2002, and Mary Rao was our nominee in the 2nd District in 1998. And, but our first nominee was Helen Bliss in 1974. That was the first time that we had nominated a woman for Congress. Uh, she didn't do so well. Uh, but, <laughs> but it wasn't until 10 years later that Dudley Dudley uh, was, so it was a 10-year difference between by the time we nominated another woman. And after Dudley, it was 12 years later that we nominated uh, Arnie Arneson in the second district uh, for Congress. Uh, we, I think, have a very, we've heard from, from uh, uh, Congresswoman Custer. Uh, we have a very proud record. Uh, these eight women are all accomplished and have uh, given so much to the state of New Hampshire. And uh, 2006, that night, there was a lot of things that happened. Uh, winning the House and Senate and the Executive Council majority, uh, winning both congressional seats. Uh, but more than winning them for Democrats, it was the person that was elected. Uh, for somebody from Manchester, I never fantasized that we were going to elect somebody uh, as phenomenal as our next speaker. Uh, please welcome our phenomenal congressman. <laughs> years and I was talking to people about you because my first response was probably like yours when I heard the news no she can't <laughs> no, no she can't and I think I called you up and told you you can't so I've been speaking to people and everybody said exactly the same thing Terry got it done and never offended without having to press the button you know you just managed to work with people and so I spoke to Republicans, I spoke to Democrats, and certainly we're hearing it here tonight that you really were an able, skilled leader that reminded people that we are gathered together for a bigger purpose than ourselves. We're gathered together to make New Hampshire a better place. And that's what you have done for so long. So I thank you for that. And I also want to thank your family because I've heard from my family, it's kind of tough to have somebody in politics, so I know how much you have given as a family as well, and so I say thank you for that. Terry is one thing above everything, though, and some people alluded to it and then when they were talking about your cards that you filled out, counting the numbers, but when I saw Terry, and I'm not going to talk about the social occasions, so they were fun, but when I saw Terry really at her finest, it's when she was working with Democrats around the district, inspiring them, nudging them, pushing them, feeding them the information, never hesitating, knowing the numbers, rattling, no notes, rattling, rattling, rattling numbers, rattling names, rattling titles, rattling everything that people needed to know. Votes, who voted how, why it was important, the impact it had, just remarkable. So you were really like a machine there. And I know, you know, this is a math background and everything else, but truly remarkable to see somebody stand up there and go from one group to the next, 
knowing everybody, everybody's voting record, everything they had ever done, things they hadn't even thought about doing yet, and Terry was delivering the news about why this was so important. So you have a cheerleader for the House, a cheerleader for the state, the cheerleader for all of us, the cheerleader for the causes that we care so much about, as well as the person that actually delivered on the floor. So I want to thank you. I, you certainly were there for me so many times, especially in that health care stuff. You know, we talked many, many hours about health care. I was on the committee, one of the three committees in the House that wrote the health care bill. And I used to say, and I wasn't kidding, that health care was making me sick. So it was rough. It was very rough. And so often I talk to Terry about that. Terry was working very hard. Whatever was happening in Washington, she knew, in addition to everything that she knew about what was happening in New Hampshire, she knew everything that was happening in Washington as well. So very skilled and very wise and a great leader. So it's been my joy to serve at the same time that you were serving. And I want to thank you for being there for all of us, whether we were holding a federal office or a state office, or whether we were volunteers or state employees or women that needed a strong voice in Concord. You've always been there for all of us. And the only reason I accept you leaving, and I don't whine about it anymore, is because I know the foundation needs you. So thank you again for all that you've done. It's my privilege to say that I got to know Terry Norelli at a time when, what's the first time you ate something years? Right. So I got to know Terry Norelli as she stepped up and soared way past what any of us, Republicans and Democrats, thought was possible in Congress. Thank you very much. I remember when um, Terry was first elected to the House and everyone was like, oh, she's something, she's something. I'm like, she's on the nerd committee. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like, know that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there that really don't have a lot of social skills. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Jeff Bradley was there. <laughs> he was the chair. Was like, she can get a lot of hymns. got to be, you know. Give it to Carson, because um, it didn't take long uh, to realize that not only was she a substantive person, uh, but she is somebody who is so passionate uh, about uh, New Hampshire, so passionate about our progressive values, uh, and she was exactly the right person at the right time, and we are all uh, so privileged to have had her serve three terms as speaker. And while it was exciting to watch her be sworn in the first time as speaker, but taking that gal away from Bill sitting facing all of you so that when my face was red and I was, um, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to see it. Um, it's kind of hard to come up here truly after all of that. Um, it's been a true honor for me over 18 years to serve the citizens of Portsmouth and to serve the citizens of the state and to count all of you in this room as my friends. Um, I want to say to all of you, thank you. And Raymond reminded me when he talked about Dudley Dudley that, and I see her shaking her head now, um, my, my husband and I moved here in 1980, and believe it or not, despite the fact that this is New Hampshire, the first political event that we ever went to was a house party for Dudley Dudley, and the host of the house party Kathy Walsh is here. So you can see 
that um, I keep my friends for a long time. So I like to keep all of you as friends for, uh, for a long time. And when I first became the speaker, I knew that um, I would be judged not only as Terry Durelli, what kind of job does Terry Durelli do as speaker, but also being only the second female speaker, what kind of job does a woman do as speaker, and being the first Democratic speaker in maybe four years, what kind of job does a Democrat do? So I felt an awful lot of pressure on my shoulders. At the time, uh, there was a record number of female speakers in the country in state legislature. Um, it also happened to be the first time that Nancy Pelosi was elected as the first female speaker of the U.S. Congress. And some of you may be surprised to hear this given uh, how many female political leaders we have in our state that I was one of only four state female legislative speakers, um, a record number. <laughs> now, there are now, or at least by the, my last term, I'm not exactly sure what there are now, by the last term that I was speaker, there were six of us. Um, and I have a picture at home uh, to prove it. <laughs> but when you have this kind of role, um, it's an honor to have heard all of the accolades that I heard tonight. But we all really know that you're only as good as everybody that stands behind you. And that includes all of the folks that spoke tonight and so many, many more. I couldn't have been more fortunate to have two such steadfast chiefs of staff. Um, I know that I would have been safe anywhere with either one of them uh, by my side. Uh, they have very different styles, if you all know, Donald and Ryan, but I'll tell you something that they have in common, and that is the dedication and the hard work and all that they did for me, for the House, for Democrats across the state, in fact, for citizens across the state, and there is no one who has been as blessed with Chiefs of Staff here as I have been. So thank you, Donald. Thank you. I'll tell you uh, one quick story, and that is uh, the night I was first elected, and we had a little champagne in the office, and, and, and when everybody was gone, and it was dark in the office, and I was wondering where Donald had gone because we were about to go out and get something to eat. Um, Alan found him. He was in the speaker's office, just sort of looking out. He'd been in the legis uh, around the legislature as a staff member for a long time. I think eight years he'd been a staff person. Eight years he hadn't been, um, some of which he was staying at home like a good dad, taking care of his kids. Um, and he, I think, was just in awe that Democrats had won back the majority, um, the two conflicting uh, dates that you're hearing, the House, Democrats to the House for the first time in 84 years, and Democrats taking the majority everywhere for the first time since the Civil War. And I think he also couldn't believe that he was standing there as the new chief of staff. Um, Ryan clearly didn't get enough of the state house because now that we no longer have the majority in the house, he's gone over to do great things uh, with the Democrats in the Senate. So thank you for both of you. Um, Mary Jane and David, um, who could ask for two better, just amazing friends, uh, colleagues. They've been part of my leadership team always. 
Uh, they're both among the longest serving in the house. Um, so I think Raymond said something about if you put David and Laura's time together, uh, you're back to... Mary Jane. Well, I was going to say so. If you add Mary Jane to that, you know, we're back to, we're back to the... Uh, no, the revolutionary war. <laughs> um, in, in all honesty, they are three of the four longest serving members of the New Hampshire House. In fact, Laura is our dean. but of course we call them old timers. Um, and one of the things that I could always rely on them for was historical perspective. And I think it's really a shame. I know that it's like the big thing to try to sell yourself as an outsider when you run for office. But what people forget is that those people that come in that are new, they have no history. They have no institutional memory. They have, and so every time they think they're reinventing the wheel. And so I was really fortunate to have both Mary Jane and David with that um, historical perspective. Um, Mary Jane, it means so much to me that, um, that she did get up and speak uh, tonight. You couldn't find a more steady, uh, majority leader or a finance committee chair. And as Raymond said, she is so quiet and does so much behind the scenes and we do all owe her a big debt of gratitude. Um, Despite the fact that um, they were two of the people that talked me into running for speaker, <laughs> that the time. Um, Martha, it's it's true that women, including this woman, often need somebody to encourage them to take that next step, to step up, to do something. And Martha was the one that was there to ask me to step up and run for the house. And I said, no. <laughs> and then the next week I said, no. <laughs> but she's right. The thing that convinced me in the end was that she talked about um, all of the work I had done on women's issues working for groups like SAS and NARO and going to Beijing and, and how this was really just a different venue and it would have a statewide impact. And that was what convinced me. So thank you, Martha, for asking me. I have to say she was a great mentor. She's an amazingly creative thinker. Um, and I have learned so much from her. Um, so thank you for, for all of that and for your continued support. Uh, Raymond talked about um, following somebody. You know, I will always be uh, the only, uh, the first of the living <coughs> speakers. That's a Democrat. Um, and, and so it is, no matter what, uh, even if I wasn't a good speaker. The next one, you know, there's that comparison. So Steve, um, you may not be very happy with me right now. Um, I'm leaving you in kind of a challenging uh, position, but I know that you're tough. I know that you can handle it. Um, some of you may or may not know that Steve sponsored the repeal of the Stand Your Ground Bill a few years ago. Boy, I'm not sure he knew what he was in for when he did that. And all of the negative, nasty stuff that was coming at him. And yet, he responded to every person that mostly told lies, I have to say, 
not with anger, not with frustration, but with facts. And I knew that that meant that he was going to be able to do that as Democratic leader, so thank you. I think I also have to say thank you to Nate Rao and to Peg Doby and to Laura Tebow. Uh, because you heard from Susan exactly what they did. Okay, you do this, then we get you to do this, then we get you to do this, and sometimes there is the sucker that just says yes, yes, yes. Um, but really, what Susan did and what the folks at Nate Rao did was to build leadership and to build skills. And they taught me grassroots activism at its best. I'm not talking about some of the stuff that passes for act grassroots activism today, but uh, Mary Jane talked about all those spreadsheets and all that counting and all that. You know what? It was NARAL that taught me that. chamber um, that I had to sort of wrangle. So, um, and, and as Susan said, that was before technology, before social media, there we were with our little index cards. Um, but there's somebody else here too, who sold me the raffle ticket that put me on that NARAL list. So Jan, I guess you're part of the fact that I'm here as well. And um, Carol, you know, there were, as I said, I was at Dudley Dudley's, uh, a house party for Dudley Dudley, and Raymond talked about women that ran, and you know, like I said, we sort of take it for granted. You know, when I was, uh, speaker, Sylvia Larson was the Senate President. We're the first state in the country that elected, had our top three elected officials were all women. When, Bev, uh, when, when Jean Shaheen was governor, Bev Hollingworth was Senate President, and Donna Sytek was the Speaker of the House. We were the first state in the country that ever elected a female sergeant at arms. <laughs> we're the first state in the country where, let's say, Jean Shaheen is the first and only woman in the country that has ever served as both a governor and a U.S. Senator. We know that the New Hampshire Senate was the first and only chamber in the country, thanks to people like Raymond Buckley and Peter Burling who went out and recruited women, the first and only chamber in our country ever to have a majority of their membership be women. in the country that had, that sent all women to Washington. And how special was it for me two years ago when I presided over the inauguration of Maggie Hassan as governor, who was sworn in by, by Chief Justice Linda Delanus. First female that we sent to Washington. And the reason for that is because Carol knows exactly where she came from. She knows exactly who she was responsible to. And we heard it all the time, the 99% of us. So thank you.
<laughs> He's nervous. <laughs> but he is a pretty good chair, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> time he was elected as the national president of the chairs uh, I, I, he said so you know some like there was a speaker that was a state chair so do you think you could call him and speak up for me and I said sure and by the time I got off the phone with that speaker's chief of staff and arrogant <laughs> uh, I was like well he owes me big time <laughs> But really, he's done a great job, not only as state chair, but as the national chair as well. We may not always agree, and when he does his little Raymond act, I just push back at him and say, no, I'm not buying <laughs> Yes, one time we met in my office at the State House on a holiday. The State House is locked. It was a holiday. And we're sitting around the round table, and I was sitting down, and all of a sudden Raymond said, Madam Speaker, do you have on jeans? And I said, I do, Raymond. And he said, but you're the speaker. I, you, you know, I don't always wear a suit. But what if something happens? Well, what if something happens and it's a day off and I'm not at the state house? But I'm, you know, he's right, I'm not wearing jeans tonight. <laughs> But we do owe him an awful lot of thanks for the majorities that we've had and our expectations for another one. Yeah. Um, I've been talking about political people. Um, actually, I just quickly want to talk about not just the people that spoke tonight, but um, some of the wonderful, wonderful people that I've had the honor to work with over the years. Um, just from the city delegation, uh, people like Celia Kane and Charlie Vaughn. Um, all of whom were part of my very first delegation. Uh, obviously, Martha and Laura. Jim Splane, who I saw at some place, Jim Splane and Paul McCaffrey. I know Marianne Blanchard's here, and Jackie Kelly Pitts is here, Ray Bowles, Betsy Schultes, Jim Powers. I hadn't realized as I was making this list, because they weren't all in order, how many of them are not with us any longer. Chris Serlin and Rich DePantima, who I know is here as well, Robin Reed and Jerry Ward. Brian Waslow, I think, I saw, and Rebecca Emerson Brown and Joe Frechette. Um, you know, you all may not really appreciate just how lucky you are that Portsmouth always sends a dynamic team to Concord. Um, I'd say the best. And no matter what the makeup has been, it's been the best. And I'll just tell you quickly that there was a year uh, Martha was still in the house, so it must have been one of the very early years. And there were five of us, and Martha and Celia and Laura and myself and Betsy Schultes, who on house session days would carpool to Concord together. <laughs> and, uh, you yeah, know, Raymond's laughing. Uh, and sometimes by the time we got there, we were too. And sometimes everybody was yelling and screaming at each other. Uh, but it was an awesome team that we could do that. We could laugh together. We could yell and scream at each other. We could disagree and agree and still go home at the end of the day. Uh, and be friends. So to each and every one of my Portsmouth delegation colleagues, I salute you. I thank you for all that you gave me and for all that you have given to the city of Portsmouth. I only had two Democratic leaders in the time that I was in the legislature, Peter Burling and Jim Craig. And um, Peter in particular really was another one of those people that said, here, do this. Well, you did that, so now do this. Um, 
And, and there were occasions that I actually said, I can't do all of that. Uh, and, and so I said, okay, then if, if I have to pick, do this one. Um, and Peter, as I said before, when I talked about Raymond too, they were so good about making sure that they were recruiting voices, everybody's voices. They recruited young people, they recruited women, they recruited minorities with a conscious effort that everybody's voice had to be represented. So I want to thank Peter for his mentorship, for his leadership, and, and again, Peter and Raymond for their conscious effort in that regard. I've already uh, mentioned the two majority leaders that I had because they both spoke, Steve and Mary Jane. Um, and then there were three Democratic governors, Jean Shaheen, John Lynch, and Maggie Hassan. Um, who I was so proud to serve with. In fact, on the very, um, the, the first year that I was elected, 1996, was the year, in fact, that the first woman was elected governor of New Hampshire, Jean Shaheen. Um, and, uh, and Maggie Hassan, not only did I serve as speaker when she was governor, but when I was speaker, she was the majority leader in the Senate. So. Um, I really do count these three governors as my friends. I enjoy, not only enjoyed working with them, but I respect them, and I think that New Hampshire is such a better place because of their leadership uh, in our state. And, um, and I got to serve with a couple of uh, Democratic Senate, <coughs> Senate leaders, um, women like Bev Hollingworth and Sylvia Larson, um, who uh, were wonderful, who, you know, Bev started out in the House and then moved over uh, to the Senate. Um, again, when Sylvia Larson was the Senate President and I was Speaker, we both had female majority leaders. She had a, a female pro tem and I had a female deputy speaker. Um, and so it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to work. Sometimes, you know, they say uh, when you're in the House, like, so the Republicans are the opposition, but the Senate's the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, another, just another minute. And I, I hadn't realized it until I, you know, got here and started saying hi to people, that so many walks of my life are represented here in the room. Um, from, from teaching at Winnicunit to sexual assault support service board members, to NARAL, New Hampshire, to the New Hampshire Women's Foundation, and the girls, you know who you are, the book club, my women's group, my travel group, and, but most and all, all of these folks and my personal, other personal friends who are here kept me sane through the toughest times, um, especially through the worst two years of my life. I bet you could guess when those were. <laughs> um, and I don't say that lightly. I, I really, I don't say that lightly. But to have all of you there supporting me during all of this, but especially during those two years, um, is a debt I can never repay, and I will always, always, always appreciate. Um, and last, but obviously not least, we all know that everything we do, especially when you have a job like being speaker, that takes so much time, where you have to travel all over the state, where sometimes you don't even come home at night, that if you don't have a family that is there supporting you, that is helping you pick up the slack at home, um, walking the dog if you're not there, fixing dinner if you're not there, you know, driving your kid brother someplace because you can't be there to drive them, um, Alan, Daniel, and Gina. Um, I'm not the only one that owes the three of you a debt of gratitude. I think I do.
there anymore, and I do, I, I do really appreciate every single day that I'm not. <laughs> and on those rare occasions when I don't, somebody reminds me, uh, like the Rochester. Yeah. Yeah. But I am still engaged. I'm paying attention to everything that's going on. I, I'm, I'm working to try to help make change. And I have to say that there are certainly things that I'm seeing right now that I don't like. And you shouldn't either. Things like the state budget and the federal budget. So better than thanking me and honoring me for our collective successes of yesterday, what I hope you will all do is raise your voices against the atrocities uh, that are the state and federal proposed budgets. It is nice to see some young folks here, <laughs> and I clearly rubbed off, she'll probably not be happy that I'm saying this, but I clearly have rubbed off a little bit on my daughter. Well, actually it was Chris Munson and Randy Cushing's fault, but they got her to be the treasurer of the Hampton Dance. <laughs> This. So it's nice to see at least a smattering of young people here. So young people who are here, you get out and get all your other friends to be active. And not so young people that are here, you need to get your kids, your grandkids, your neighbor's kids, your nieces and your nephews, because the only way we are going to win in 2016 is if we get young people active and out to vote.